I like it raw. Raw. Ooh, baby, I like it raw. Ooh, baby, I like it raw. half hour with the latest on the death of Chris Cornell. The music world is mourning the loss of the rock icon who died from an apparent suicide. But now Cornell's wife is questioning the coroner's conclusion. In a statement, Vicki Cornell suggests the prescription drug Ativan may have contributed to her husband's death. Just hours after this concert in Detroit on Wednesday, Soundgarden frontman Chris Cornell was found dead in his hotel room. The medical examiner ruled it a suicide by hanging. However, in a statement, his wife Vicky explained why she believes prescription medication may have contributed. When we spoke after the show, I noticed he was slurring his words, she said. He was different. When he told me he may have taken an extra Ativan or two, I contacted security and asked that they check on him. The family's attorney acknowledged Cornell was a recovering addict on prescribed anti-anxiety medication. Studies have found rare but serious side effects from Ativan can include worsening depression and thoughts of hurting yourself. Vicki Cornell shared her grief over the loss of her husband of 13 years, writing, His world revolved around his family first, and of course music second. I know that he loved our children, and he would not hurt them by intentionally taking his own life. Black hole sun, won't you come? Cornell, who performed here on CBS This Morning Saturday just last month, talked about how he looked forward to writing new music with his band Soundgarden on their coming tour. It's a good thing that we're going to be together for the next month and a half. Because you think music will come out of that? Since we got back together, it's been productive and um, harmonious and fun. His distinctive voice, called the Howl of Seattle, has now been silenced. The Space Needle went dark in tribute. And his wife, mourning the loss of the man she called her best friend, wrote, Chris's death is a loss that escapes words and has created an emptiness in my heart that will never be filled. You know, w one of the really stunning parts of this was when he was here last month, he seemed like he yeah. was in really good shape. And, and he seemed optimistic about the future in your He interview. was talking about how excited he was, first of all, about, you know, because he played the, uh, he wrote the song for The Promise, the film, and he was really excited about that and excited about the tour that he was on. So, you know, this is... It's, it's a shock. It's, it's a mystery a and a tragedy. All the way around. Yep. Is writing a song for a film different? It's different and sort of unique to the film pretty much every time. Chris Cornell began writing for films in 1998 when his song Sunshower appeared in a seduction scene in Great Expectations. The whole thing that sort of pivots around the scene is Ethan Hawke trying to put his hand up Gwyneth Paltrow's leg. That one wasn't one of those moments like Philadelphia was for Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. <laughs> this was just the horny scene. <laughs> Whatever, it was good though. In 2007, he was commissioned to co-write the song You Know My Name for the James Bond film Casino Royale. Was it all intimidating writing for a Bond film? A little bit, because their, their budgets are huge, you know, and I end up with like this sort of editorial staff in my head of different voices and uh, whoever is paying the money from the film company, their voice is one of them, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, is that a good voice or a bad voice? It's always a bad voice. <laughs> it's never a, that's incredible, that's awesome. <laughs> Every note you're writing is perfect for the film. <laughs> Cornell actually scrapped the first song he wrote for the new film, The Promise, but then found inspiration in its story about the Armenian genocide. An estimated two and a half million Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks were killed during and after World War I. One of the few physical things people would grab and take with them when they were running for their lives, literally, and fleeing from their villages was photographs of loved ones. And photographs of you rescued from 
He experienced Led Cornell, whose wife's family is Greek, to visit a refugee camp in Athens this month. It was pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. They're real, and we need to do everything we can do um, not to forget them. Um, and that, that drew the line to me back to the promise. That echo of, th this is happening in places right now. This yeah. isn't just history f set in, in a beautiful drama. Mm -hmm. This is today. On Wednesday, 52-year-old musician Chris Cornell was found dead just hours after concluding a show at Detroit's Fox Theater. The last song Cornell performed was a cover of Led Zeppelin's In My Time of Dying. In his time at the top of the rock and grunge scene, Cornell had battled with substance abuse and other demons that have plagued many of his contemporaries. However, in recent years, Cornell had seemed to overcome those demons, moving to Florida with his family and opening up about his long-term sobriety. Yet Detroit police have claimed they are treating Cornell's death as a suicide. Police spokesman Michael Woody said, We are moving in the direction of a possible suicide, but we are waiting on the medical examiner's office to provide the report. If I had any regrets, that's about um, my participation in Soundgarden and anything else I did musically in, in the 80s, 90s um, was, was just that I drank a lot. I was the guy that was always on time. I was the guy that always made sure things got done and that we were, we were doing what we needed to do. You know, I was very responsible, but I was also drinking all the time and so I have this kind of memory of always being hung over really not always being drunk or being happy those periods were in there but when it came to to being creative I, I remember that as being an obstacle all the time Seattle had been this isolated provincial little petri dish of of art and music that was allowed to kind of grow and uh, because nobody cared about it by the time the idea that there was a Seattle scene started uh, reaching outside of Seattle. All of all of the Seattle bands that that we all know of as being part of that scene were we were all out touring. So by the time the scene was internationally known, it didn't really exist in that way anymore. And people from Kansas and and Nebraska were driving to Seattle and you know living together in a small like studio apartment to start bands in Seattle the same way that they would in. Uh, a couple years before that, that go to the Sunset Strip. And that, that was very weird. Soundgarden was the first band to be approached by major labels in Seattle. And this predated Nirvana and it predated Pearl Jam. And it predated all of it. It wasn't really overnight success for anybody, certainly not Soundgarden. There was a little bit of an uncomfortable transition that I think all the Seattle bands had, which was it was anti-commercial. It was anti every institution that supported commercial music as well. If you remember when, when Kurt and Nirvana were on the cover of Rolling Stone, he was wearing a t-shirt that said corporate magazines still suck. I thought, well, that's great that he wore that and they put that on their magazine, but he also showed up for the photo shoot and did the interviews and agreed, you know, wholeheartedly and happily to be on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. So how is it that in a sense, he's not sort of tearing himself apart doing the same thing. And we all kind of had that crisis of mind. And, you know, Kurt shooting himself was probably the, you know, that to the extreme. Singer of the rock band Nirvana was found dead in his Seattle, Washington home today. Police said Kurt Cobain apparently shot himself, leaving a suicide note behind. We came off stage and we're about to go on for the encore. And... Um, I think uh, the bass player Ted came in and told us. He just kind of barged in and was emotional and started talking about um, the reports that they'd found Kurt, and, but they weren't sure if it was him or not. Um, but it was, you know, and we all got very emotional. It was very surreal. We weren't home. We weren't around any pe people we knew. I guess in a sense, we could all take solace in the fact that, especially Soundgarden, that we were sort of born from this idea that we played kind of dark, moody music and our identity, which in a sense kind of was a band that created the soundtrack for that weird, that type of weird, awful scenario. This morning, the music world is remembering grunge rock pioneer Chris Cornell. Cornell died unexpectedly late last night. He was in Detroit and he was 52 years old. 
His music career spanned more than three decades and he performed with a number of bands. This video is believed to be from his final show last night in Detroit, just hours before his death. Anthony Mason is here with a look at how Cornell changed rock music. Anthony, good morning. Good morning. Just before that show at the Fox Theater in Detroit last night, Cornell tweeted out a picture of the marquee. He was in the midst of a month-long tour with Soundgarden, the band he fronted, which along with Nirvana and Pearl Jam were founding members of the Seattle grunge sound. Chris Cornell helped redefine the sound of rock and roll in the late 80s and early 90s. Emerging from the Seattle grunge scene as the front man of Soundgarden, the singer was known for his octave smashing vocal range. His talents spilled across a number of lineups over the years, including the supergroup Temple of the Dog. and a seven-year run with former members of Rage Against the Machine in Audio Slave. Exactly, it's exactly in the worst. <laughs> Last month, he told me he was working on a new Soundgarden album. And how far away is the new Soundgarden album, do you think? Um, one of the things we did when we got back together was decide to never put a clock on what we do, which I think has been really helpful and it just always being a positive experience. And in the studio that day, he performed an acoustic version of perhaps Soundgarden's best known song, Black Hole Sun. extraordinary performance that day. This news has just, has just stunned everybody. Came out of nowhere. 52 years old. He has three children. Uh, in a statement, his family says they'll be working with the medical examiner to figure out exactly what happened. No cause of death at this point. I'm in front of Detroit Police Public Safety Headquarters and right across the street is MGM Grand. Police tell me they got a call around midnight from a family friend who said they needed police response, emergency responders at MGM Grand Hotel. That friend said he went to check on Chris Cornell in his room and found him dead on the bathroom floor. This was the scene Wednesday night. Chris Cornell and Soundgarden stopped at Fox Theater on their concert tour. Melissa Bering, a local musician with the band 7 Million Gigawatts, was in the audience. Everybody in the whole venue was just, I mean, they were going off. It was a blast. Everybody was jumping and screaming and clapping, and it was fun. You could tell, you could tell the audience was really enjoying the show. Detroit police say a short time after the show, Chris Cornell's wife called a family friend and asked him to check on her husband. That friend busted into his hotel room and found him unresponsive. First responders pronounced him dead at the scene. Well, it's weird when you think about how fast someone can be there one second and not there the next. Detroit police are waiting on the medical examiner to confirm the cause of death. They are calling it a possible suicide. Melissa says she knows it is hard to be on tour away from support. It's lonely. It's, it's really lonely. It's hard to go from being in front of a lot of people with a lot of attention and having that sort of moment and then kind of just sitting in your room by yourself. Detroit police tell me right now they are waiting on the medical examiner to determine the exact cause of death as they move forward. They believe it appears to be a suicide, but they have not ruled anything out and will not do so or release any more details until the medical examiner gets a chance to make a finding. Listening to Chris Cornell was like listening to um, a voice dipped in honey, dragged across train tracks as a locomotive careered over the top. Last night, the world lost yet another rock legend. Chris Cornell, lead singer and songwriter for Soundgarden and Audio Slave, had been touring in Detroit. When his wife tried to call his hotel room and got no answer, it was discovered he'd taken his own life. 
just hours after publishing this Facebook post. From the moment I heard, I just laid down in, in my room and I put on Super Unknown, and it feels surreal that Chris Gornell's no longer here. Soundgarden are credited for kickstarting the grunge explosion in Seattle in the 80s and 90s, inspiring bands like Nirvana, Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains. Chris Cornell has such a, a broad career. He did a, a whole album with Timberland. He produced a Jeff Buckley's record, songs for My Sweetheart the Drunk. You know, he had Bob Dylan covering. That's one of the highest accolades you can get. A story that I will always remember was my next door neighbor who was 18 and I was 12 showing me uh, down on the upside. And I loved it so much that when he left his room, I couldn't uh, go home without it. So the first CD I stole was Down on the Upside. Not only did Cornell front two separate and massive bands, he also joined an exclusive club in 2006 when he voiced the theme song to James Bond's Casino Royale. Considered a musician's muso, 52-year-old Cornell's lyrics were often dark and now prove hauntingly insightful. There's this element of finding that character that is the singer of the songs. The more challenging the material, the closer that person becomes to me, but also the, there's more of a sort of desperate nature to that person. A father of three and a devoted Seattle Seahawks fan, Cornell had moved away from drugs and alcohol later in life while maintaining regular stints on the road. If I had any regrets about the 80s, 90s, um, was, was just that I drank a lot. Today, family, friends and fans unite to remember and honour a troubled soul lost far too soon. In my eyes, in this pose, in this Tom Larkin from She Had briefly crossed paths with Chris Cornell when he toured with Soundgarden for the 1994 Big Day Out. And he joins us now. Tom, what are your reflections on Chris Cornell? Um, a game changer. Uh, I remember in particular the, the, the band that I'm in, uh, She Hard, uh, Soundgarden and their early albums uh, played a pivotal role in us actually changing our style and becoming the band that we became. Tom, were you surprised by the nature of Chris's death at all? Um, on one hand it is shocking. When anyone who has been an icon for you or, or a leader um, goes away, death is, is hard, to, hard to take any time. Insofar as some of the research I've done around working with artists, um, the idea that artist life expectancy is in fact very short um, meant that his death has not actually come as a shock. The research shows, um, and there's been studies done across the UK and the EU and in the United States, that the average, average age of death for a musician is around 57. Oh. Oh. So does that mean that we're doing not enough to protect our musicians? Music itself attracts people um, whose way of operating and their kind of creative gifts uh, also have another side. It means that they're more sensitive and they're more likely to be overwhelmed and particularly overwhelmed by aspects of life that others are more resilient and able to take in their stride can often knock someone who's sensitive and creative right over. Um, add to that the fact that the environment of the music industry is in fact a brutal one and it's brutal in terms of uh, the kind of psychological climate that it can have, uh, the permissiveness around uh, drug and alcohol use, and also economically. Um, for instance, in Australia, 80% of all musicians in Australia exist under the minimum wage. You know, the general population has the statistic that one in five have a propensity towards mental illness or depression and anxiety, um, and actually with musicians it's one in three. So we're talking about a very vulnerable group of people who are in a very, uh, you know, a high stress and anxious environment and it's tough to survive long term. One of the darkest ironies here, of course, though, Tom, is that Chris was quite critical of the way that popular culture seems to, I don't know, romanticise or even celebrate popular musicians who end up dying young. So uh, how are we meant to react to this? You've got to remember a legend like this, but how, what's the appropriate response here? One of the biggest myths around artistic creativity is that the idea that you've got to be miserable in order to tell great stories or you've got to be crazy in order to make great art. The fact remains it's not actually true. Um, what happens is that people who are miserable create very little art 
It's only when they get some clarity or some perspective on that misery that they're able to kind of see something else and see the story that they lived through and then produce the art. But the bottom line is most creative people um, need clarity and health in order to produce great work. Two people with knowledge of the plans told CNN Saturday Chris Cornell, the lead singer for Soundgarden, will be laid to rest on May 26th in Los Angeles. Cornell's body will be flown from Michigan to Los Angeles on Sunday. The sources said Cornell will be buried at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. One of the sources told CNN the family is thinking about a public memorial for fans, but is coping now with their loss and the funeral service. Cornell was 52 years old when he died Wednesday night after performing with Soundgarden at the Fox Theater in Detroit. The medical examiner's office in Wayne County, Michigan ruled the death a suicide by hanging. During the 90s, Soundgarden cemented grunge as a powerful new genre of music. And with songs like Jesus Christ Pose, it's hard not to think Jesus when Chris Cornell sits in front of you. Your first show in New Zealand's already sold out, and I think yeah. 20 or 30 minutes. That's good. Yeah. That's not that many minutes. That's a good, that's a good brief number. Of How many minutes, minutes is a good amount of minutes, do you think? Four minutes is really good. And Cornell knows about ticket sales, fronting three different bands over the last 27 years. There was Soundgarden, of course, which split up over a decade ago. Then there was Temple of the Dog with Pearl Jam's Eddie Vedder. More recently, Cornell cut his hair for Audio Slave. Now Cornell is bringing the music of all three bands and a solo career to New Zealand, acoustically. I can hear somebody from, from ten rows back shout out a song, and I can actually talk to them and hear what they say, you know, because there's a, there, it's more of a church. It's so unusual, you've got a straight dialogue yeah. if you want with your audience. Exactly. Cornell says it's a happy time for him, Soundgarden reuniting after 15 years, back in the studio making more music. Musically, we're moving on. It's not, we're not sort of worrying about working on music that we would feel is nostalgic to older fans. The biggest difference I noticed um, that we haven't even really talked about is that um, there's no beers or bottles of Jack Daniels around, and there was never a discussion about we should do this and not have beers or bottles of Jack Daniels around. It's just not there. Any chance we'll be seeing Soundgarden uh, back in New Zealand at all? Yeah, and, and you know, now we're sort of st strategically looking at calendars with everything, and, you know, including my solo career and what everyone else is doing to find a, a place to put a pin in so that we can come to New Zealand. And, Great. And you know, we've talked about some different, I, I don't know when that's going to be, but, it, but it'll happen. It seems sensible to end where it all started, his voice. You know, the best way to, to find yourself as a singer and, then, and try different things is to literally just kind of sit in a room and see what your voice will do and try not to be shy about it. Nothing can take away these blues nothing compared Nothing